welcome to the entrepreneur next, next door uh we did this a couple years ago but at that time i didn't record anything on video i wanted to catch up i know a bunch of things uh, are new with you so let's let's run through the beginning quickly but let me first allow you to introduce yourself so who's it type for um thank you so much pleasant to be here and always good to chat with you so um who I am who am I you know it's a big question but uh I'm a little of a lot of things um entrepreneur mentor coach uh, consultant um but I'm trying to just be the best version of myself most of the days that's kind of a summary I'm dealing I'm doing a lot a lot of work into the entrepreneurship and startup world if it's um consulting and mentoring and coaching uh, entrepreneurs founders and um and professionals more a lot about the business but a lot also about the mental side of the journey um in addition to uh, I love to create so I actually uh, have a small company where I'm buying and and creating like um, either websites small projects and things or small SaaS platforms um in the last year or so and um and yeah and I you know entrepreneurship in in, in general has always intrigued me since I was a kid and uh, that's where I'm staying were were your parents entrepreneurs or no no so where no. where where do you think you got that bug um I do believe that you know in general I think each one each person in this universe is unique like snowflakes and um you Each one has their own character and personality. So um, yes, you're taking things from home, um, but it's not necessarily your personality. It's just things you take. Most of the time they're not as good. Um, and you're still carrying carrying it with you for for many years after and, and you realize it's not yours, it's your parents. But um, yeah, I, I was always I always loved the, the freedom to to create and do things that I that I want to and I always, You know what intrigued me is the the process of just deciding on something and just go for it and I guess I realized that I have a strong willpower I guess when I was um, 14 or 15 um, back then I was um, I I met I I, uh, I tutor English and math people within my high school I was like let's say the 11th grade I think and I tutor people either a, a, a year younger than me and my age and And uh, when I realized that a lot of people want me to do that for them, I uh, spoke to my uncle and he had like a free room in one of his buildings that he was managing. And I'm talking about like a, a, the, a, the era where there's no internet yet and, and no uh, iPhones and things from that nature. And um, I just called to a bunch of people that I know are students in, in universities and I asked them, hey, can you teach groups? And I basically... We, um, build up like a small school of, of tutoring when I was in high school. Um, I guess I was 15, I think. And that's it. I didn't take money from my parents since I was then, you know, uh, doing this thing. I have other jobs that I did. Um, and uh, I opened like a, a school of, of tutoring where I had, I think, at the peak, something like uh, 30-something students. And I got a nice amount of cash out of it. It wasn't with credit card or things like that. And I used it to travel to... Uh, to Europe a few times to buy my first computer to buy clothes um, um, for my own money um, and it's not about the money that was intrigued is the ability to to do things I can um, I, I remember even in high school I always did stuff um, I like to do things that are not the the norm or the min, mainstream in a way that I thought about something and I want to go and created it um, and I think that I When I when I was turning 18 we I was recruited to the military as, as everybody in Israel when they turned 18 and that was the most difficult thing for me or, or may, that's maybe that's the point where I realized that I need my freedom to create because in the military it's very structured um, where I figure out or I realize about myself it's limiting me and I felt like I I mean again I was doing my best as always and I was a commander in the uh, in the military and everything but I felt like I would never stay more longer than I need um, and I realized that I need this fr- freedom to create and do things my own way I'm not saying it's a good or bad way but it's my own way um, and I love I love the I would say the the uncertainty of the entrepreneurship you know um, people people that are not entrepreneurs um, usually, getting um, 
step away from entrepreneurship because of the change and the uncertainty. And the, the first thing I'm telling everybody, in order to love entrepreneurship, you need to embrace the uncertainty, to hug it, to love it, and to, to basically walk around, walk next to it proud and happy because you enjoy the journey. And, and that's kind of how I'm looking at it. And I never looked at the result or the fruit of the result as the indicator of success. I said, if you can think about something and you want to go and create and you enjoy the process of creating, it doesn't matter if you are an entrepreneur that write articles or you designer or you carpenter, doesn't matter. Just the fact that you do things that you love and love what you do, that's the gift of entrepreneurship rather than what in today's 21st century where people think it's success is the entrepreneurship way. But realistically, it's uh, you better go to the casino if you want to be successful rather than to do entrepreneurship. You know, once one in a thousand, it's not a, it's the odds that they are against you. Um, so you should stick to the nine to five job if 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 you want just the the financial security. And that's kind of my uh, short story about uh, entrepreneurship. So so that was a, a a beautiful quick introduction. So I'm going to speed this up and go to because there's a lot you've done since we spoke last time. So. You finish the army, you decide to come to New York to go to school, right? You go to Baruch, you get a, yeah. you major in uh, in business administration, entrepreneurship, and I think minor in IT. Um, and and I'm going for memory, so you'll correct me if I'm wrong. And you you live in, a, in New York City with your girlfriend, I believe. And one day you guys have an argument, not a fight, but it was an argument about laundry. Right. <laughs> and and something happened because of it. So let's talk about that day and what what that unleashed after that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that growing up, I was used to having uh, my mom around doing all the chores and, you know, doing things from that nature. And as I grew up, I, uh, I you know, I, I wasn't a fan of doing the, those uh, chores. You know, I was very respectful of my time. And for me. I felt like I was wasting it and start living with my girlfriend together at the same house, you know, open a can of worms in terms of the behavior of each of each other. And that drove me to um, to a lot of fights like, hey, I don't care. I don't want to do it. And, and back then, at least in New York City, there is most of the apartment doesn't have washer and dry, dryer in the unit. So it, either in the basement where you're fighting with 30 other tenants on like four machines and, and, and fighting for quarters and, and things from that nature. Or you can go to the locals or call them or whatever it is. But the process is is tedious. It's not in the hours you want. It's not convenient. And you eventually waste a lot of time. And the frustration of the time problem was the biggest, I think, uh, um, trigger for me to go and say, hey, like as a busy professional living in, in a major city, it's, it can be the right thing. And I think it was the beginning era of, of Uber, of Airbnb, of this on demand again, I'm talking about 2012, 13. We we're talking about 12 years ago. It was the beginning era of the on demand, and I felt like um, can be done differently. I had a good friend. Um, his name is Tommy. Was the co-founder with me, and we kept like meeting once a week in in Bryant Park to chat about. You know, we always were early adopters. We weren't into the startup scene. I was a director in a big fashion company. Um, um, you know, dealing with internal operation things from that nature before. But I said. What if I can solve this problem for myself? Um, and we kind of like brainstorm about this thing. And if he, he told me, yeah, I have the same problem. And, and, you know, we start talking to people around us and it seems like, hey, there is 3,500 um, um, laundromats and cleaners. And still, if people around me suffering from the same problem, clearly the solution of solving the time problem wasn't solved. So that kind of intrigued me mm -hmm. to think about opening my... Uh, my startup, I would say. So, so to be clear, the and and I might just fast forward because at some point I was going to talk to you about one of the key ingredients, or really the the basis for entre entrepreneurial success. And you and I know that that's we can say for sure. If you don't get this concept right, you're not going to be successful. And that goes to you know market product fit. Right. So yeah. in your case, 3,500 laundromats, dry cleaners, wash, dry and fold, which means you can bring your dirty laundry to the laundromat or dry clean. They do it for you. 
and they fold it for you, but it's actually pretty expensive if you if you look at the cost per pound. But you, you, what you're saying is there's a problem here that's unsolved. Even though there's plenty of laundromats, people are still frustrated about the laundry thing, and there is a solution, right? Yeah. What was the solution? Um, so the solution for us was, you know, an app or, or uh, an application that basically brings someone to your door at a time of your convenience, which means early morning and late in the evening where you're actually at home, not like uh, the middle of the day where they are open, it's not relevant for you, seven days a week, and actually come to your door, pick up your stuff, and return to you 24 hours later, clean, folded, and whatever needed with your credit card on file. You don't need to add tip. Tip is included. Um, even if you're in a dormant building and you don't want to carry it or schlop it around because you have a huge, and you're a woman and you have a huge, you know, 35-pound uh, bag and you don't want to start carrying, we come to your door. And everything we thought about is how to make the experience seamless, but actually save them the one to two hours a week that are actually spending on laundry rather than to solve them the price issue or the quality issue. Because those, if you want to go and pay high premium to a very high laundromat, or you want to go very cheap to a very cheap per pound, that you can do. But the problem is that nobody was there looking to save the time problem. And my, our target audience, which is the, you know, the, the problem and the target audience are the primary ingredient to this product market fit, which in our case was the target audience, busy professionals, in major metropolitan metropolitan cities, making more than 100K and, you know, go to the gym, like to go for happy hour, um, uh, having hobbies and things from that nature. So they appreciate their time more than anything. So for them, one or two hours a week back to their schedule, it's a lot, it's worth a lot more than anything else. And I was that person. This is why it was easier for me to relate to the problem. Um, and I found that there is a lot of people like me. So that's where we find our segment to go into the market. Of course, later on, as we grew as a company, we're able to, to do more um, to the different audience. But at the beginning of the stage for product market fit, you have basically three components. You have the um, the um, the side of the product and the, uh, sorry, the, the part of the target audience and the problem, which is the desirability. You want to say if there is a desire for a specific group of people to solve a specific problem. Then you have on the other side of this um, Venn diagram, you have the feasibility. Can I deliver some kind of a solution that can actually provide value to this problem, to this target audience? And can I do it in scale? So that's the part where you're thinking, okay, let me develop a solution. In our case, it was an app. In certain other cases, it can be whatever. Um, but again, the problem is a consensus. The solution is one way to solve it. And we found that way. And the third component is viability. So it means that can you now bring value back to the business? Again, if you are for profit um, in, this, in the sense of either profit or revenue or um, in like Facebook case, growth or users. So you need to bring value back to the company. So you can have the most amazing uh, problem, the best solution, but if it doesn't make sense financially, then it's not going to have a product market fit. So those Three components, um, um, desirability, feasibility, and viability are the three components of the Venn diagram to go into the product market fit and tackle it. Right, and and that's that's a great point because, I mean, I watch Shark Tank. It, it's probably the fourth and fifth times I watch the same shows over and over again because I learn something every time. But the one thing that always resonates with me is when the shark tells someone uh, who theoretically has a great idea and they start to describe the business piece, and then they get to the viability, which is where they want the investment, the sharks would say, this is not a business, it's a hobby, right? So the, the point that you're making is, yes, you can have great idea. Yes, there can be a market need. There's a problem you're going to, you, you're solving. But if you can't turn that into the viable, a viable, sustainable business that's actually making money and of course can grow, then it's a hobby, right? It, it's a great idea that's going to yeah. wind up going nowhere. So the the thing that intrigued me last time we spoke about this, that um, uh, when you think about your target audience who are young professionals or successful making money, no one's going to go sit in a laundromat and watch 
clothes spinning in the dryer and waste their time, even if they can be on their phone, right? There's better things they can do with themselves. The part that intrigued me when we spoke last time was the operational part of it, right? So the idea, get, you know, somebody has an app, they call you, they say, I'll be home at 6.30, you provide them with bags, they can separate delicates or whatever, everything, that's easy. The tough part for me in, in what you've done was you're not going to do the laundry, right? This doesn't happen unless you get an operational logistical structure of people you can trust to do this correctly and finish it on time, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's funny enough, today I'm de dealing a lot with SaaS um, and uh, softwares. Um, and By the way, so Itai, just because I always like to, my audience are not always marketers and, and people like us. So SaaS is software uh as a service yes as a service which would be anything you subscribe to and it could be an app could be anything go ahead so you're dealing with yeah, a lot so, of so so in that sense um what we deliver is a service right because we brought something to someone's door of their own clothing this is not yes software was involved but we're not selling the software we're selling the service because they paid for laundry being done so it's funny because when I'm talking to a lot of founders that have only software where they can grow internationally with no operation almost, you know, I'm, I'm trying to explain them, hey, you know, I, try, I was trying to build like a full, you know, uh, um, operational challenge where you have the customers, the drivers, the cleaners, your warehouse, and all in all, in all you still need to provide a service that clean clothes, which that by itself is not 100% boom, because it depends on quality of the fabric and, you know, you can control like a lifespan of a garment or, or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, I think the, the best way for us or, or the best way we did it is we didn't go deeply into the side we know at all. Like we tried something very uh, plain at the beginning. We didn't like try to make it complicated. We found like a local area because we, when we started, we started with a few zip codes in the Upper West Side. I lived on, on 85th between West End and Riverside. And I said, okay, that's a good spot, Upper West. That's where we're going to start. We took a few zip codes because I can actually deliver, right? Because that's what we have in the beginning, me. Um, and at that point, we just start with local person. And we want to learn more about the customers and what is needed before we go and commit into a full operational building, right? Because building an operation, it's a lot more expensive than building a software. Um, so... In that case, we realized as we grow along that the locals look using the locals can be also a downfall for us because the level of customization and support we can give to our customers is limited. So the operation is always kind of like develop as we go along. We never build up the amazing operation we had three years into this business in the first year. So it's just a reminder for everybody that is building that although you have this dream of amazing seamless operation, at least with the physical operation, that you need to create pro, uh, um, um, you need to create processes, and you need to start it. You know, you start with like testing, experimenting, creating your first, you, and then you start thinking about like scaling it. Like you need to first, if I cannot do it on one zip code in the Upper West Side, even if it's manually in a way that can deliver value to the customer, then why do I'm looking here to scale? And that's kind of mm -hmm. the mindset of building the whole operation. So every step that we grew, we added another layer to this operation. So at the beginning, we didn't have sophisticated software to navigate the drivers, right? We have, okay, I see on the map, this is 85th, whatever it is. Joe, you need to go to this, uh, whatever, do. Uh, and, you know, we got on the app the request and we did it manually. Little by little, we developed the technology to automate the manual task we did in order to provide like the seamless flow of operation. And... At the end of the period, I would say that we had a dis dispatch system that uh, we had dispatchers that are remotely, and I'm talking about back in like 2014, 15, that remotely manage hundreds of drivers on the same shift on their screen with having automatic routing and um, text messages going up and around from all the, from the screen and everything is being seen and communicated to the warehouses and warehouse system and a driver app, like an Uber app and like all of those layers of, of, of controlling this operation in order to create seamless operation. And still, it was diff this, still difficult because you still have laundry to take care of and vendors to make sure. And I guess when we merged the company in 2020 with another company, we went vertical 
and we merge it with a company that actually clean. So we can go even deeper into this customization for the customer by cleaning ourselves and being able to reduce some errors and, and, and frictions. So, so there were, the idea was great. The need was there. Finding customers was relatively easy. Using the app to allow them the convenience of ordering the service, right? Um, but then you, that these are things you control. But once you hand this over to a, a driver that needs to go when when the customer said, I'm going to be home between 6.30 and 7 a.m., you can come pick up the laundry, right? Uh, yeah. I'm thinking New York City. I'm thinking traffic. I'm thinking I can't find parking. Um, <laughs> it's kind of scary because because things happen, right? It, it might have logistical problems that at the end, maybe they miss the customer, right? It's and, and people tend to be not very forgiving, at least in the beginning, until they experience the service, right? Oh, I, I he said he would be here. He wasn't here. I had to go to work. Now my laundry is sitting there. What I could have done is go down to the laundromat and just drop it off, right? So these yeah, are the things yeah. you have to deal with in terms of operations, which affect the service and the value you provide. That's beyond the idea that you started with, right? How do you navigate all these things? These are people that clean, drivers that drive, people that bring the clothes back, bringing the right clothes to the right customer and not mixing things up, right? It's pretty scary. Yeah, T to come here and tell it was easy, I, I would be lying, you know? It's a, a sleepless night and, and uh, a lot of trial and errors. And um, I would say that the way we thought about it is we try to talk to think about all of like at the beginning we use the locals right as a hub and spoke kind of thing. So you come, you we let's say you have a cleaners in the Upper West Side, we're using him or you know a down like another one if they're getting to capacity. Yeah. Um, but what we found out that our driver is going to waste a lot of time parking in the middle of of Manhattan just pick up and 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 deliver to the cleaners like because when you delivered something to someone it's become complicated because you're taking their it's not like a food delivery, which is one way. You now need to uh, also bring deliveries to people, but also pickups, which are different, right? You need to return the clothes clean, which is another complexity versus mm -hmm. food delivery. Because food delivery, you're taking, you're delivering. In our case, we need to clean. And now you have someone's clothes clean, but also you have a dirty one that you picked up. So it's become complicated. Um, and the way we, we solve it is we try to put all of the little things that can be helpful for us. So for example, um, if it's a dormant building, right? There is no necessarily a time friction. So um, come early and we'll, um, the, the, our routing algorithm will put all of the dormants at the beginning of the shift. So you can knock off those that you, you can just park in front of the building because it's a dormant building and you can just knock, knock off those things. We're gonna, um, uh, our algorithm centralize like uh, a, a location where you have a lot of pickups around the same time and build it up in a way where you can park once, but maybe pick up from two different buildings mm -hmm. and like taking two bags and just do it. Um, and we start putting like, right, like um, and we start looking, looking into like the right turns, left turns, what's is slower. And we also collect data, which is funny people, uh, like people, when I told them they didn't believe, each drivers, I know that Waze did it later on, but before Waze did it, each driver for us is, took a photo of the building when they got there. Why? Because you know how is uh, Manhattan is, and like you suddenly it says like seventy eight, and you're not sure if this this bill or whatever. When you see the bit, so every driver that got out of his car, we also mm -hmm. we did a few things. We first we took the photo of the building, so it's straight ahead. They know where to go. They know oh, is it seventy eight? Is it sixty? Whatever. Second, we did um, we collect we when they arrive to the place when they park, we took timer into their app until they get to this location. And then we ask them how many stairs they went and we calculate how long it took them to go back and back to the car. So we start calculating buildings that takes longer versus shorter time and it depends on the parking too, right? So we start calculating those little things and eventually um, we got to a point where our drivers on average did anything between four to five pickups or drops up in one hour, an average, which that's where how we made money. And the whole kind of like little things that maybe look in a in a short in a small volume is nothing, but when you start doing thousands of of 
of orders, those things are adding up to create more seamless operation to get there on time. And of course, from the consumer side, we start thinking about what will be, like if I'm a customer, what will make me uh, feel a lot better? So for example, we didn't want them to wait because let's say you're giving an hour frame. You don't know if it's going to be after 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or five minutes before the end, right? You have an hour. So what we did is they automatically, when our driver finish the previous one, they got a text with the current location and, and they knew that, okay, whenever I'm getting the text, it's a 10 minutes mark for me to get my things ready. So they didn't need to wait the whole hour. They just was ready for this text. To, to So it's little things that we feel are insignificant, but when you're talking to users, those are the little things that make them say, okay, I want to stay with them versus going to other alternatives. And like thinking about what can you do and not what you cannot do. You can always say, I cannot do anything and uh, it is what it is. S suck it. You have an hour, wait. Or you can think mm -hmm. about how can I provide more value, especially in a very competitive um, thing. So so one of the things that that you and I know about about marketing and solving problems is that our biggest, when we have a great idea like you had, your biggest competitor is not someone else that's doing what you're doing, but it's what the the customer is used to doing, right? Because if they have a way that they that they do laundry today, as complicated or as waste of time, uh, wasteful as it might be, you can propose something new to them. But if they get frustrated, they always go back to the old way where they're comfortable. They know it sucks, but they'll do it. So it, it's the, the idea and the execution have to be so good to overcome the the tendency of people to always go back to what feels safe for them which is i know my routine i'm okay doing it even though i realize it's it's not good enough so that's sort of like a challenge and as you're describing the iteration of how you constantly improved the system so that the ultimate experience for the customer is seamless as you said it right because the whole idea was i'm going to save you time and probably going to do your laundry in a better way that you do it yourself. Okay, great. But now you can do this in like an Uber thing, right? I click, the car comes in. I know who the driver is. I know what car it is. I know how long it's going to take me to get to where I need to go. And if I'm going to be late, I can tell them I'm not going to be there on time. Off you go. And you can repeat, 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 because the experience is so valuable. So um, I'm going to fast forward again. You guys... As you were doing better, you needed to go find some funding. You wind up with the Y Combinator in on the West Coast, and you got the kind of the, the financing round that you needed to actually now take this proof of concept, which was no longer proof of concept, but you you demonstrated that this is something that's viable and it's working. Now scaling it up means taking over Manhattan and going to other big cities mm -hmm. around the country, whatever it was. Um, how long was it before it was time for you to exit when you felt you were ready to exit? Was it somebody came to you and said, we want to buy you out or you, you felt you got to a point where it's time for someone else to take over? It's a good question. Um, I feel like the moment when you're getting money from investors, people don't necessarily think, they, they only see the one perspective of it. Okay, I got money, now I can spend. But what you're doing is you're going in bed with someone as an investor in a decision-making kind of uh, um, process where they now on your board and they can make decisions. And in, in the, fa the same way that they can make decisions, they can also block some of your decisions or your freedom, I would say. And it's not about investor is bad or good. It's they, each VC or venture capitalist, they have their own strategy, their own um, uh, narrative of, of or their own like appetite to do certain things. So if they want to go in a certain way, it's because of their strategy. They not necessarily care about what you think, it's about what makes sense for them too as a venture capitalist. And the moment we realize that is jeopardizing me and my founders kind of uh, ability to go even uh, like continue foreseeing our future and, and make it a lot more attractive and, and fun. I realized that we're losing the reason why I even 
start entrepreneurship or this startup, right? So I will give you a scenario. What happened to us is like back in, I feel like 2017 or 16, before the pandemic, before everything, we had this idea to take what we're doing and create a secondhand market because we not we we not only had people's clothing but we took photos of them as we always have your virtual closet and what if you're in new york right now and it's summertime or the other way around and you can now rent your clothes all over the us and using the the clothes that's sitting around like a nice leather jacket that you're not using and uh, right, and eventually sell it and create a, a huge secondhand market because we have the uh, the operational foundation, having those warehouses in different cities. We had also the Rent the Runway um, um, head of operation as our advisor, which he built the biggest dry cleaners facility in, in the US, Rent the Runway, our big um, fashion rental companies. So we had everything ready and we had this presentation, knew how we can create a lot more than what we did. And afterwards, what happened in the US is a lot of like the the economical and, and with, uh, you know, what happened with the global warming and everything, everybody's about not drawing and, and consumption. So eventually we were today blowing up, but because the investor, it, it, it wasn't aligned with their strategy of where we process or where we progress, they just said, no, you're not going to do it. And they have this veto right on decision making on some points. So I realized that, hey, if I'm losing, I'm losing my passion to, to innovate, to bring new stuff, to help customers, you know, and 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 to do those kind of stuff, then I already had this switch in my mind. And at this at this point, I guess for the next year or two, I was like, you know, debating with my partner, with my uh, co-founder, and um, we weren't rushing into it, but we knew it's a matter of time. Like we lost the passion that we had day one. And this is where people like from the outside think it's all glamorous, but sometimes, you know, you remind yourself why you even start this path. And your why was, I enjoy creating things and bringing value and, and evolve within it. And if I feel stagnant, then it doesn't work for me. Like I can feel stagnant, but I can just go work for nine to five, making a nice amount of money. Mm -hmm. Why do I need this thing? I do it because of this thing. And if I, when I lost that, it was a signal. And eventually an opportunity knock on our door and you know, it was a good, good opportunity and a strategic merger for us. And uh, yeah, and we took it with both hands. You know, it took us a while to, to physically do it, but eventually we did it. Amazing. So, Ita, so you, you guys get an, an offer to be acquired, uh, and obviously you take it. Um, what would you say was, looking back up until that point, what was the biggest lesson you learned from, from that adventure? Yeah, um, it's hard to quantify uh, eight years of, of running something into one, but um, I would say since I also become a lot more spiritual in the last six or seven years, um, it's the lesson of that everything you do in life, it's about the experience. And um, and I always remind myself when I started what I started, it wasn't for the fruit of the result. I wasn't there for the fame and fortune or knew it going to go to where it went. Um, but it was more focused on Hey, I want to experiment doing things by myself, solving this problem by myself. If I got, you know, I remember telling to myself at the beginning, what if I have, you know, five people that I don't know that, that I can create value for them? And then when I got the five, I said, what if I'm going to have a hundred? And when I got, I got the hundred, I said, what if a thousand and then tens of thousands? And I remember that I enjoyed the most the process of, of growing and learning um, about myself. So I feel that every entrepreneurial journey is a stepping stone into learning more about yourself. Why? Because it's an expedited route. If you're going into the nine to five, you're probably going to stay static for a while. But when you're doing some kind of like this, I would say entrepreneur journey, especially in, in a bigger scale, you're basically getting lessons of 30 years of learning about yourself in six or seven years of, of process. And that's, I think, for me, is the biggest lesson is to remind myself always why I'm coming into opening anything. If it's a, a business that I want to do, if it's anything that I do in life, 
remind myself that I'm here just to experience. And in order to experience, it's like a child, right? They don't know what is right or wrong, if it's good or bad. They just experience, right? And that's kind of like my biggest lesson is if anything you should do, you should do because you want to do it. You remember your why, but then you're going into experience and you're not locking yourself into it has to be this or it has to be that. And that open mindset, I feel like it's my biggest lesson because I had it in the beginning, but as we grew and changed some some of our, I would say, stages in the company, I kind of like little by little forget about it. And um, and I think now, if looking backwards, I remind myself, if you always remember that you do things not for the fruit of the results, it's almost like expectation. When when you're getting you know happy or unhappy is where you're putting an expectation. And if you seize it or you're going under, and that's how you decide happiness. So if you remove the expectation, just do for the sake of you're enjoying it and you want to do it, magic things happen. Like the universe is taking care of all those little details and, and mm -hmm. things are moving. And that's what happened to us in the beginning. We purely wanted to experiment on building our own solution and, and we didn't know where it's going to take us. And so this I, it, childish it, kind of act, that's, I think, the magic. It, it kind of reminds me what I used to tell my MBA students um, that if you're going to start a business because you want to make money and be rich, then don't bother because the odds are against you. But if you want to start a business because you might want to make a difference or in your case, experience something, take your own creativity and provide value to five people, right? Then ultimately, I don't want to use the word, you know, the why thing because it's become cliche almost, right? The the Simon Sinek thing. It's always about the why. It is about the why. But as you said, it, it's a lot more intimate in terms of who you are in recognizing who you are and what you want to do in life uh, and, and making a small difference, right? And you kept saying it's not about the expectations. You know, to me, I'm transla translating that to mean it's not about being rich and about making a lot of money. Ideally, when you do things right, for the most part, and you have a good product market fit and you provide value and you provide experience that people want to repeat and repeat and repeat, and you're very careful that you don't drop your guard and the level of service comes down. And operationally, you're doing things correctly, right? Um, you will make money, okay? Maybe you won't be more, maybe you won't be an Elon Musk, but you will be able to make money because if the need is there and you solve the problem and you do this in in a in the type of intimate, high-level way of providing the experience and the value. You can't really go wrong. Most most companies that we know that fail, fail because of either bad strategic mistakes or operationally they got too big too fast and then their level of service drops and then people just leave them or they're just badly managed, right? Financially or otherwise. So you wrote in, in your opening post for this year, here are six lessons I learned in 2023. Um, I'm going to run through them very quickly because I think they're they're great. Show the universe your dedication to your dreams. It will respond in kind. Real friends aren't just nice. They're straightforward. Honesty is key. Surround yourself with someone even more fearless than you. It accelerates your growth. Your journey is unique. Don't compare it to others. Focus on your path. Embrace uncertainty. Change is the only constant in life. Instead of resisting it, learn to embrace and adapt to change. It's the path to growth and innovation. Trust your intuition. It's a compass for making decisions that matter. So my my two favorite things here, they're all really good. There there are two things that that I love. One uh, is the intuition part because I believe the intuition is something that actually exists. Um, I remember you know the book Blink that that dives into it in a way. Um, trust your intuitions. I always tell people I have I have a pretty good intuitive sense. It's about 90% right most of the time, but what the 10% that it's wrong, it's painful, right? But as you said, you learn from those mistakes. The one I want to focus on is surround yourself with someone who is more fearless than you, plus point number two, which was about real friends, people that are straightforward. So I want to talk to you about something that, that you spend a lot of time on, which is being part of Growth Mentor, where I'm also part of the platform, and that's how I met you, the mentoring and the coaching, right? Yeah. 
did you have a man i'm going to use the word interchangeably although there is a difference between a mentor and a coach at least in my world because i'm a because i'm a business transformation coach um but we'll use it as the same term for now did you have a mentor or a coach during that that eight years that you were building your business yeah 100 percent. i had um it started with actually when we started we had um uh, my good friend from high school, um, he moved to the U.S. when he was like uh, 20 and he had his entrepreneurial journey. Keep in mind, I didn't come from from, from startup world uh, before I started my startup. So, um, I, you know, he helped me in the beginning, you know, if it's, if it's just giving me the right guidance, show me some potholes ahead of me and just keep keep me in the loop. Give me a different perspective. You know, sometimes you just need to hear a different perspective to open your mind to some other outcome. And I think that it also um, helped me realize um, the best version of myself. So I feel like people tend to think that either a mentor or a coach is the ability to create a change for you. They are not. They only there for you to give you enough perspectives and, in, and inspiration for you to dig in and do this work for you. And I guess that's what he was able to do. And funny story, he did it out of as a friend with no cost, generous of his heart. And when we raised the seed round, we gave him as a gift 2% of the company. We didn't have to. And we mm. did it because that's the level of value he was able, and of course, later on, we made him even the chairman of the board and things like that. But, um, and I and I think that um, one thing that I'm going to mention that I think is relevant for what you said and also the, the stuff that I wrote there about the intuition and all those things, um, I think that I, I totally agree with what you said. And, and our heart is our smartest um, genital, I would say, because um, our brain is analyzing things that is irrelevant for us. Mm -hmm. But this world is 100% subjective. Zev can only say his truth from his own eyes and Itai can only say his, right? So everybody's give perspective of their own. That's why the, the world, I like it when someone say, let me give you an objective uh, um, opinion. There's no objective. You come from your own eyes and your own experience. So it's a reminder that, you know, okay, you learn to listen, whatever, but be skeptical because you have your own path and the, the, the heart calculate your true feeling. And there is a saying that there is two things that this, uh, dictate the quality of your life. You know, someone may say it's money, right? But then I'm asking myself, if, if, if quality of life is dictated by money, how come someone super rich is super miserable, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't, or, or love, but how come you can love someone from your full of your heart, but it can make you miserable, right? So the two things that actually create quality of life, our first is emotion, and second is meaning, purpose. So if you don't have meaning or purpose, sometimes that's why people even get to, to being, like you, you can get to a point where you're in a level in your life, you have money, but you don't have the purpose, the meaning, you, you feel, you know, you feel bad. And emotion is how you experience the world, and that's tied to the intuition and the heart, right? If it doesn't matter what is to happen out the outside, if you don't feel connected, happy, um, excited, and whatever it is, that's dictate the quality. So without that, it doesn't matter what you have around you. So if anything, in, as a reminder for yourself, and I guess that's why mentors sometimes are there to remind you those things, I guess is, you know, those things that is matter the most because of their experience that they went into this path. But still, everybody needs to do their own path regardless. Yeah, it, it as you were talking, it, it remind me of another one of my rants is is the the word passion, right? Everybody throws the word passion all the time. I'm passionate about this. I'm, it, it's just a word that, that's completely meaningless. I always, at least in 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 my inner circle of clients and people that I interact with, it's that I don't care about your passions. I mean, it, just substitute the word passion with purpose, right? What is your purpose? Because you can be passionate about whatever you want, but that's not the same. And it's sort of like the theme of of everything you've talked about today is is having a purpose. And then the second piece is happiness. I guess it's it's the the crossroads of you know what your purpose is and you're actually executing on it, right? 
and so you feel that you are contributing you're 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 doing something most of the time by the way Ita, and i know for sure you you'll agree it's it's doing things for other people it's nothing to do with yourself right you have to be really unselfish to be happy that's sort of like my 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 theory about that um yeah it's always more it's always more rewarding to give to someone and and by the way how how you dictated it from your emotion right when you give someone suddenly you feel great but sometimes even when you're getting something it's can be okay okay I'm getting something but giving it's you feel a certain emotion that fills you and again what's dictated it the fe- you're feeling a lot better that's even if you look at it from a tactical perspective not from giving for the sake of giving just the act of giving is giving you a lot back so you're basically treating yourself by giving to others in a way so. right and and I think the key is also you giving without expectations that you're gonna get something in return right you you have to start from that from that standpoint I'm giving because I want to make a difference in your life because I want to help you because because you asked me but I'm not expecting anything in return and that's the basis of the enjoyment of being on a platform like growth mentor where for the most part everybody that's on there and I think we're up to maybe 600 mentors worldwide, Everybody is giving of their time freely, right? The, the people that use the platform have to pay a subscription fee, but we sit with somebody for 30 minutes or an hour and completely change their lives with zero expectation. It's just watching them, the reaction of what this, this second, third opinion perspective that they don't have, that a coach and a mentor can only give them because we can't fix our own problems. And you see their light their eyes light up and they start to scratch and say wow I never thought about this and that really made a difference to me um so I, I want to talk to you just for a little bit about AI because you're nibbling in the AI world with with one of the apps that you came up with I think maybe a year ago um w- what's your take about this whole AI thing right because you Clearly, it's a disruptive technology, probably as as disruptive as the internet was in the year 2000 when it became commercialized. But there's so many things that can go wrong with AI that they already started, right? Um, in my universe, when I work with entrepreneurs and they hire either through me or with me or somebody else, they hire a marketing copywriter and they and you know for a good copywriter, you have to pay. to get good copy for your website, for your emails, for other content, right? And, and we know a few good copywriters and growth mentor. Um, you have to pay for it if you want to get good stuff. So all of a sudden, AI shows up and the small business owner entrepreneur says, why do I have to pay so-and-so? I won't mention their names, you know, $3,000 to, to completely rewrite my website or more where I can just go to Bard or ChatGPT, take whatever is there and say, write it better. So what, what's your take on it? Because again, um, I know you're dabbling with it and I think your approach with your uh, slash slash application to slash to slash, right? Was, was about time savings, right? It's not, yeah. so, you, so you minimize that you have to go back and forth to back and forth. So go ahead. Tell me what, what do you think? Where are we go? What, are we, what do you think about it? And where do you think we're going with this? Ah, it's a, it's a big question. I know, it's a loaded question. Yeah. So I would start with, I would start with that. I think that every advancement in technology is something in, inevitable. And I feel like even if I would go like way in the past, I feel like these days the, the technology is growing super fast. So you're not even ne- necessarily like paying attention and suddenly things are happening. So I guess AI is part of it. It's not everything. So if you look at it from a very, like a narrow perspective of people's jobs, then <clears throat> I think people are missing the point because um, I think that a lot of the criticism I'm hearing is regarding, you know, the workforce. You know how it's going to impact the workforce and the economic side of things um I me personally I'm not a fan of the content of of AI like I can notice it from from a mile away mm-hmm. um, but again even content it's very subjective so um, some people like I like to the point 
and and very like concise and coherent and you know the the gpts of the world are like trying to fluff things out um some people love it some people don't so i think that what it's not going to change ai is the ability for the individual to grow and develop and i think if you're looking at ai from a fear perspective then you're always going to be behind because i'm not saying you should love it or try it you know you should just know that it's there and it's going to provide something so you might as well take what you feel can be relevant for you and i feel like if you do things out of i'm going to lose my job or what's going to happen or you you're creating like um i would say like an energy of missing out about fear about anxiety of things then it's just going to pass through you and you're not going to be able to take advantage like for example the tool that i've built i didn't come to say that ai is good i actually said the other way around i said okay i'm going to build a productivity tool because to keep going to chat gpt and hope that it's going to revolutionize something it's not going to work so i get to it an understanding that you know to get killer content at least with ai you have to have a killer at least with ChatGPT, let's say, a killer prompt. Right. So I said, if I'm not an expert in AI, but I want to take advantage of some kind of, again, it's not going to necessarily going to write for you like, you know, whatever amazing writer you feel you can be, but it can help you with the right prompt getting ahead of time in terms of your time of doing a task. For example, maybe it can create for you an amazing outline that you can walk out of it. Maybe it can create for you... Um, when you have like a writer's block, it can give you a good foundation to an ideas that strikes something. Maybe it can give you like a blog post or a post that is still rough around the edges and you still can do a lot of stuff, but it gives you something to start with. It's, it's, um, it definitely cannot replace yet, at least in my opinion, the level of, of a lot of human hours. However, it can minimize a lot of processes that you do currently mm -hmm. and um, and what we in Tuslash doing is we are um, like a prompt-free AI assistant. So we build a huge library of, of prompts that are ready for you. So you don't need to go and scramble around 10 times, ask the ChatGPT, no, do it this, do that. Like, okay, we build, an, like with our prompt engineers, we build a very strong um, um, prompt that with one command, you're getting something that you can actually use. And that's why it's produ productive because it's not productive to say AI is saving you time. And then you find yourself 30 minutes, try to write a sentence that you can actually write it in two minutes, right? So we yeah. try to balance that. Not everybody needs to be an expert to use an AI. And this is the kind of like the connection we made with two slash and not necessarily, our tool is actually not for an advanced AI people. It's actually for, people that are, let's say, on the daily basis, marketer or um, community managers that need to always be on top of things and write and whatever, and, and sometimes needs a, a quick summary of, of things that are happening or a summary of text or an article. They need to have like a, what to write back in, in a nicer way of how to like rewrite certain things or things that you can actually use for the AI, which can be very um, efficient. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that... Um... Look, I, I see so much on, particularly on the LinkedIn platform, right? Everybody is coming up with, we have the bots, they automatically connect, try to connect with you. We know it's the most annoying thing, spammy thing in the universe. And you can tell that it's a bot very quickly, so we can ignore it. But now, you know, somebody I know just is on a whole platform just for LinkedIn to automatically reply to, to messages which is which is from a productivity standpoint, it's okay. But for me, fast forwarding to the thing that bothers me most about AI is the lack of individuality, right? It's it, when AI, the prompt that delivers content for you, it's not you, you didn't write it. And so you have to find a way to balance what a potential output can be with rewrite it yourself using the AI engine that gave you some ideas so that you don't lose who you are. So your voice is never lost. Um, so, uh, I mean, three years ago, I came across Jasper, which was, I think that's their new name. I forgot what they were called. Brilliant. Yeah, Jasper, right? Brilliant content 
this is three years ago before all the hoopla that started last year. And I paid a hundred dollars a month was part of the platform. Never used cut and paste ever because it's not me. But what they did that was brilliant was they asked us to always correct, give them feedback on the output, where it missed, where it could be improved. And they really spent a lot of time and money and effort to constantly, you know, fine tune the output so it doesn't seem so robotic and so automated and so foreign, right? Um, so yeah, ultimately it's it's a great productivity tool. I think you, you and I both wired for efficiencies, I think. So it's a great tool. Uh, I've seen something that for travel, the a one of the AI engines, you can say, look, I want to go to Athens in two months. Where are the best places for me to visit? Which are the best hotels? Are there any restaurants I should be? I mean, that stuff can save a ton of money, ton of, sorry, ton of time for somebody who's planning. So for productivity planning, great. For content writing, that's the piece that worries me the most because people are too too quick to do the cut and paste thing. Um, yeah, but you know what? Um, I, yeah. To just to balance to to be the devil advocates here, um, not this, not that. I mean, I feel like art in any form is for the beholder. You know, like it doesn't matter, like. I would read or, or like even with all this amazing AI, okay, still an artist that works and do and bring his own stuff. It can be in, in, in design, it can be in whatever. It's still, um, he brings what they feel. And I feel like um, I'm not judging. If I see something that I like, if it was created from an AI, then it's amazing. But if it's not, and I feel it's not, and it's, that that's what I'm saying. We have our own detector. And I, I guess... Um, you like you spot a spam from a mile away. I'm saying, mm -hmm. like nothing would change you. So, if anything, you just need to keep looking to what you want and what you like. And I feel like humans in their nature is evolving, and we get used to a lot of stuff. So we got used to now we're gonna see a lot of answers similar. So we less and less gonna want to hear that thing. So it's gonna help. Um, bring more humanistic kind of approach to to AI, which also then evolve because we're going to get used to it too. So it's like, that's what I'm saying. It's it's a stretching point where it's not like you, you got to it. It's not binary. So this yeah. stretching is always going to evolve. And this is why my, my kind of two cents about anything in life is to understand that um, you have to live in the present. And present is a gift in English, right? And it's also to being present, to being right now. And I don't know where it's going to take me and I don't know what happened in the past. But I know that if I will focus on my things today, if I don't like this content that I'm reading right now, it doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future. I don't need to, or, or in the past I was skeptical, whatever it is. If right now that's what, and that's why I think people need to stay in their vibes. Like how can I evaluate things right now without the discount rate on my core and the, Am I reading this content or not? And if I'm not, then it doesn't interest me. Or like, that's how I think people should look at it versus, oh, everybody's talking about AI. I have to. And, and this way, you're living the fear and the anxiety rather than your true self because mm -hmm. AI can be an amazing thing and it can be a terrible thing. It's up to the beholder. And that's how I see AI as, as anything we do in life. I don't believe, I think that we as humans, now it's more, I would say, philosophical and, and spiritual. I think as humans, we always have this tendency to fight the, the polarities, you know, the good, the bad, fair, not fair, uh, best, worst. And w because this tendency to evaluate things on a spectrum, we forget that we, in the third dimension that we are, we need to have this kind of a neutrality where we take some of this negative and and, and darkness within us even, you know, when whenever we enlightened is after having a darkness or challenge or whatever it is. And, and understand there is no like one truth. And this like understanding there is no right or wrong, then you can actually be yourself more because you mm -hmm. are not trying to, to catch one polar to say, I'm in the right direction or I'm in the wrong direction. Actually to be no direction and be your direction, that's the only thing that the universe is asking from you. And I think that's where you're getting back. Most of the people that get a lot of progress in their life is people that tend to not necessarily categorize as one of the polars, but more about 
being, you know, having this kind of like a third eye of themselves and connected to their heart, as we talked about, and their, in, you know, intuition and intention and brings a lot, like creativity comes from being connected to yourself. And if you mm -hmm. don't like something, it's because you're connected to yourself. It's not about if you don't like something, it's bad. You don't like something, it's fair because that's your perspective. And if we start judging each other on if things are good or bad, then we're losing our purpose here in this universe, which I feel is to experience and having our own path. And this is why part of the of what I wrote in um, in my uh, kind of like lessons for 2023, mm -hmm. I said, your journey is unique. Don't compare it to others. Focus on your path. Because what is good for me today, like Itai 10 years ago, doesn't have the same mind of Itai today. So, and Itai in five years doesn't have the mindset of Itai today. So how come I can already dictate things that's going to happen in the future for me if I don't know what my mindset will be in five years? Or it's different than what it was five years. So living in the present, giving you the opportunity to even make it more connected to yourself, to embrace that, hey, maybe we live in today's day in AI. I don't know what's going to happen in five years. Right now I'm exploring whatever works for me or not. Who knows where it's going to take? I'm not going to um, worry about something that didn't happen. Or maybe maybe I would fall in love and in five years I'm going to be an, an AI uh, guru or AI going to die. But who knows? So sticking to this present moment, it's help you experience the process and everything that happened without this kind of binary approach, either I'm here or I'm here, you know, it's not, you know, it's, uh, that's kind of the neutrality of things that I see life in general. So I, I think this will be a, a good high point to, to end our conversation because it's so positive and enlightening, despite the fact that you know, uh, uh, some people just stop watching the news and read the paper because all you hear and see is, you know, the bad stuff and you can't get, can't help but get sucked into this doom and gloom thing. But but your way, the way you just described how you lead your life with spirituality and embracing the moment and not really worrying about where it is going to be in five years, because that was going to be a question I considered asking you, but I was, but I'm not going to, because you answered it anyway. <laughs> so, Itai, thank you so much. Well, I, I'm gonna have to do this every few years as I follow you and and I see it as as you continue to grow and discover different things. Um, if you want to connect with Itai, he's a busy guy. I will share his LinkedIn profile and information. And thank you again. This was absolutely wonderful. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time. It was a pleasant as always. Thanks.